Welcome to the Bold and Determined Podcast with your man Victor Pride. And right here on the Podcast for Winners, we're bringing you motivation and mindset for the killers and real dealers, the makers and the takers, the winners and the grinners, and goddamn, even the sinners too. Let's get started. Well, hello, my friendly friends. Welcome back to another edition of the Bold and Determined Podcast with your man, Victor Pride. And before we get into today's episode, let's talk about what I did this weekend. This weekend, I took a plane to Buenos Aires, Argentina, and uh, spent the weekend there just to check it out, see how about it. So I'd like to tell you about my experience in Buenos Aires before we get into today's show. Buenos Aires. In Spanish, it is pronounced Buenos Aires, Argentina. So I flew to Buenos Aires on a Friday night, and I returned on a Sunday night. Now, my Friday night flight was delayed by about four hours, so I did not get into Buenos Aires until about four o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning. So Friday was wasted, spent sitting in the airport. Saturday, woke up in Buenos Aires, and uh, before I talk about Buenos Aires, let me talk about what I heard about Buenos Aires. I had heard that Buenos Aires, Argentina was very European, very white and very stuck up is what I heard people say about Buenos Aires. They said it was very stuck up. The people were stuck up. The people thought that they were better than everybody else, this and that. And that kind of put me off of visiting Buenos Aires for a long time. I'd also heard that it was like a European city in the middle of South America. I don't know exactly what I was expecting when I went there, but it was not like I expected at all when I went there. And what I mean by that is I did not feel that the people were stuck up at all. They seemed very nice and very friendly, very peppy, quite happy to me. And I spent uh, all day Saturday, I basically spent all day walking around the city, checking things out, walking into cafes, coffee shops. Of course, I checked out all the butcher shops, all of the supermarkets, Another thing I heard about uh, Buenos Aires is that they have great beef. That's what I heard many, many times about Buenos Aires and Argentina in general, that they have great beef. Well, I was very disappointed in the beef. Let me just get that right out of the way right now. I was very disappointed in the beef for the very specific reason that they cut off all of the fat of every piece of beef that I saw. I must have went into 10 supermarkets and butcher shops, and I did not find a single piece of meat with any fat on it. So regardless of whether or not the beef is good or of good quality, they cut off the best part and threw it in the trash. The fat is the key to great health. Saturated animal fat is the treasure of human nutrition. And they cut it all off. They cut it all off and they threw it in the trash. So as good as the meat might taste, to me it is useless. Meat without fat is trash. To me, it's trash. I would never buy a piece of meat that had no fat on it unless I had a nice chunk of fat to eat with it. The secret of the carnivore diet, the secret of health, is to eat saturated animal fat. And you'll notice that as people stop eating saturated fat, start eating more vegetable oil, start start eating low-fat products, cancer rates skyrocketed, heart disease skyrocketed, obesity skyrocketed, diabetes skyrocketed, yet people still blame the fat. People no longer eat fat. They eat fat substitutes. Yet they still blame the fat for their obesity, their heart disease, their diabetes, and their cancer, which is just plain silly. People today are obviously no longer eating the fat that they should be eating. And as proof, some of the best beef in the world supposedly is in Argentina where they cut off all of the fat and they throw it in the trash. But that's neither here nor there. I'm sure that if I spent more time in Buenos Aires, I would be able to find some fat somewhere. I would be able to uh, eat the meat the way I want to eat it. Now, I did go to 10 or so places and found no beef with fat whatsoever. But that's just me. Most people don't like to eat fat because most people are completely unnatural. Now, in Buenos Aires, I woke up, I went out, went to a cafe, drank some mate, and then basically I just walked around. I just wanted, when I go to a place, when I go to a new city, I don't give a damn about the sights. I don't give a damn about the tourist spots. I want to see what it's like in the real city among the real people. So I usually just walk around, see what the place is like. And considering I only had two days in Buenos Aires, that's all I did. I spent all day Saturday walking around. I probably spent seven hours Saturday just walking around. And I had heard that the people in Buenos Aires were very uptight and very hoity-toity, like their shit don't stink. 
That's what I had heard from so many people on the internet. When I got there, I did not feel that at all. It did not seem to me that the people were uptight. It did not seem that they thought they were better than everybody else. They did not seem hoity-toity to me. They seemed just like regular people. Easygoing, friendly people. And even a group of seven girls on the street came up to talk to me. Seven girls, probably 18 years old, maybe 16 years old, right in the middle of the street. And the streets were very busy. The streets were super duper busy. Super busy. This was a Saturday, of course. The streets were super busy. I would, it had started to rain. I was getting into my backpack to get my umbrella out. And I always travel with an umbrella. Pro tip from a seasoned traveler. Always travel with a small umbrella because it rains a lot and you don't want to be stuck in the rain when you don't have a car, when you don't have a house to go to, things like that. So always carry a small umbrella with you when you are traveling. So I was getting my umbrella out of my bag and these group of seven girls came up to me and they asked me something, but they asked me in Spanish. Now they were asking directions and I understood that a little bit because I understand a little tiny, tiny bit of Spanish, but I am basically retarded when it comes to speaking Spanish. Now, if you went up to a retarded person on the street and you went up to me on the street and asked for directions in Spanish, you would not be able to know who was the retarded person because my Spanish is so poor, basically non-existent. And if you're traveling in South America, you need Spanish. You really, really need Spanish because they don't speak English. They have their own language. It is Spanish. Just like when you travel to North America, you need English. When you travel in South America, you definitely need Spanish. So this group of seven girls, and they were very attractive. And let me back up a little bit. I found the girls in Buenos Aires to be highly attractive. They were very pretty, and a lot of them, much better than where I am currently. So for anybody looking to travel somewhere, might want to put Buenos Aires on your radar, because the girls were, the girls were pretty good. Let me put it that way. I was pleasantly surprised in that area. So this group of seven girls came up to me, asked me for directions. Like I said, you would not know me versus a retarded person if you ask for directions in Spanish, cause you get, cause you're gonna get the same answer. They come up, they ask for directions. Where is so and so? And so you have to think in your head about the Spanish you know, and you come up with, I don't like bananas, or something stupid like that. So you never know a retarded person from a non-Spanish speaker in South America. That's the worst thing about not speaking Spanish in South America. You look like a retard, basically. When anybody tries to talk to you, you look like a grinning retard. So I told the girls I don't speak Spanish. I don't know where their their thing is. Da da da. Missed opportunity. Whatever. Now regarding the architecture of Buenos Aires, they had great architecture. It was really good. And uh, even though the people were a lot nicer, a lot friendlier than I'd read about on the internet, They were 100% correct about Buenos Aires looking like a European city. If you blindfolded me and you dropped me in the middle of Buenos Aires and then took the blindfold off and said, where are you? I would say to you, I would look around and I would say to you, I think we're in Spain. That's what it reminded me of. It reminded me of Madrid. Now they call Buenos Aires the Paris of South America. I don't know how they get Paris from that because they don't speak French. They speak Spanish. They have a very Spanish flavor, a very Spanish influence. To me, it looked a lot like Madrid. It looked like a weird sort of Madrid, a part of Madrid that I'd never seen before. But I would have never, if I had just been dropped there with a blindfold on and I didn't know where I was going, I would never think that I was in South America. I would think that I was in some Spanish city that I'd never heard about. So it was very, very European. It was very, very, people were friendly. The girls were not fat at all. A lot of attractive girls, even a lot of blonde girls, which surprised me quite a bit. It really was quite European. It was like a European city in the in the middle of South America. I saw a lot of pretty girls there, and they all seemed rather friendly, rather open. They all seemed rather interested as well, which is a little bit weird because I have a gigantic beard and... uh It's been my experience for the past year that girls don't like beards. And by the way, I want to give a nice happy birthday message to my beard, which has reached one year right now. Now is the one year anniversary to the very day of me recording this episode. It has been one year since I last shaved my face. I've been growing a beard for an entire year. And growing a beard has taught me a lot about patience. Because growing a beard at first, it doesn't look good. You go through the stage where... It looks awkward, it looks bad, just looks dirty. It took me about three months to get through the awkward stage of growing a beard to where it looked like I had a nice 
full thick beard instead of just a nasty beard basically so growing a beard can teach you a lot about patience and i've always wanted to grow a gigantic beard basically all my life but for whatever reasons before i always chickened out well one year ago to the day i decided that was going to be the last day i ever shaved at least for a long while and today is exactly one year since then one year since i've shaved my face and today i've got a gigantic beard gigantic i look like i live in the mountains. When I was walking around the streets of the busy cities of Argentina, I looked like a man who had just wandered down from the mountains and was uh, just hanging out in the city for the day. And I did seem to get a lot of interest from the girls in Buenos Aires. And the reason I find that interesting is because A, I have a gigantic beard and girls don't like that. And B, I had read on the internet so many times that the girls were stuck up, the girls are hard to get, all this kind of stuff. I didn't find that to be true at all. And that's why I want to bring it up to you. Everything I read on the internet about the people of Buenos Aires, to me, did not seem true. It did not seem true at all. They were correct about Buenos Aires being very European, but it was not my experience that they were stuck up in any way. Now, of course, I was only there for two days. And when you're somewhere for two days, you don't know shit about shit. I admit that. I understand that. I don't know shit about Buenos Aires. I was only there for two days. These are my experiences of the two days. If you want to get a real experience of somewhere, you need at minimum one month there. At minimum one month. Two days you're still in the honeymoon phase. You don't know shit about shit. But these are my, these are my experiences. I found the people pretty friendly. I found the girls to be attractive, very white, even a lot of blonde girls, very nice looking. The food, I did not eat any beef there because the beef had no fat. I don't eat beef without fat. It just seems like a total waste to me. The beef without fat, it does not satisfy. If you eat beef without fat, you've got to eat, you've got to eat either fat or carbohydrates with the beef. Because beef without fat by itself will put you in rabbit starvation. You don't want to eat only protein. You need protein and fat or protein and carbs. So I figured, I've been to 10 supermarkets. I can't find any beef with any fat on it. Let me just try some Argentinian food. See how about it. Now, Argentina is famous for their empanadas and their pizza and some other things. So I ate some empanadas and goddamn, those things tasted good. They tasted real, real good. I didn't feel good after eating them, but they tasted good. So it was very pleasurable eating them, but then I paid the price with the stomach ache and burping, and I really don't feel good eating that stuff at all anymore. At all, I just do not feel good. When you eat a carnivore diet, when you take most of the foods out of your diet that you used to eat, you understand fully exactly what they do to you when you finally do eat them again. So when I eat something with wheat or bread or oil, God, I feel it right away, and it makes me feel just sick. And I think back to all my life before when every time I ate, I felt sick. I would always think to myself, I would always equate eating to feeling bad. All my life, until I started eating meat only, I, f I thought that you just felt bad after you ate and there's nothing you could do about it. When the reality is quite different, if you just eat meat, you feel great. You don't feel bad after eating at all. You feel fine. You feel good. You feel normal. But when I eat these foods like empanadas or I also ate some pizza... God, you feel it. You really, really feel it, what these foods do to you. And you start to understand that, God, most people in the world, they live on fake food. They live on food that makes them feel sick. And people don't even know that because sick is their normal. It's their normal state of being that they feel like shit. They're burping all the time and farting and stomach ache and acid reflux and all these kind of things that I don't get if I eat just meat. So I know exactly the way that people are feeling, even though they look good on the outside, they're smiling, they gotta, they're pretending like they're not trying to hold a fart in, all this kind of stuff. I know what it's like eating that food, so I know what people feel like, and people feel like shit today, because they're eating all these foods that make you feel like shit. Simple as that. Now, regarding Argentinian beef, they say that Argentina has more cattle than they have people. I think they say that about Argentina. So it, it's a great cattle country, it's a great beef country. My only bone to pick is that they cut off all the fat of the beef in the supermarkets. And because of that, actually, I take that back. I did buy some beef. I found a, uh, a chunk of ribs, a small chunk of ribs, costillas, they call them, and I ate that. The beef was good. It tasted just like the, uh, the beef where I am now. So it tasted natural, tasted fine. The beef itself was good. I just had a real hard time finding any beef with some fat on it. And I ended up throwing away a good chunk of the beef. So Argentina spent all day Saturday walking around, checking it out. Had a good time. I got good vibes from Argentina. The problem with Arge with uh, Buenos Aires is that, goddamn, the buildings were so tall. They're so big, just like a busy European city. Where I am now, there are basically no tall buildings. 
or very few tall buildings. I live in pretty much the sticks. I live in pretty much, if there was such a thing as a rural city, that's where I live for the time being. So it was a big difference getting into the big city and feeling the energy of the big city. And I'll tell you something about the big city, something that I felt in Buenos Aires. When I got to Buenos Aires, when I was walking around in Buenos Aires, I got the urge to make a ton of money. And that is something specific. That is something that I specifically feel in big cities. I feel the energy of big cities. And when I'm in big cities, I go into money-making mode. I want to make some money. That's what I want to do in big cities. I just feel it. I get ideas about making money. I get ideas for new products. I get ideas about how to make money. And I just start thinking money, 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 money. Even though there's nothing I want to buy, I just start thinking about money in the big city. So if you're an entrepreneur or you want to be an entrepreneur, I really cannot recommend living in a big city enough because living in the big city puts you in that frame of mind where you just want to make money. You just want to make money and you start to think about how to make money. And I felt that right away. Damn, I need to make some money. So that is one great thing about living in a big city, a big popular city like Buenos Aires, is that you go into money making mode. Where I am now, like I said, it's, it's a city, but it's basically primitive in a way. And there are other things that I concern myself with. And of course, I'm in a position where I don't need to make more money. So there's no need to go into hardcore money making mode. But I feel if I, uh, if I stayed in Buenos Aires for a month or two, I'd go directly into money making mode. So Buenos Aires, two thumbs up from Victor Pride. I enjoyed it. The food tasted good, even though it made me feel like poo poo. The girls were pretty. They were thin. They were light colored. They were not Indian. They were definitely European. They were definitely Spanish flavored. They were not Nordic or English looking. They were Spanish flavored, but they were definitely very European. They were friendly. It was rather cheap as well. I heard it was so expensive in Argentina. That was not my experience at all. It was cheap. Cheap. When I got to the airport, I went to the ATM and anytime I go to a new country, I go to the ATM and I get out as much money as the ATM, as the local ATM will allow. And I usually do that twice. And I figure if I'll do that twice, that's at least enough money for a few days until I figure out what's what. So I got money out twice. I, don't, I didn't look at the uh, exchange rate beforehand because whatever. I don't care. Whatever the stuff costs, I'm just going to pay for it anyway. So I don't care what the costs are. I'm not a budget traveler. So I don't worry about these things. So I got out, I think it was, it was 2,000 pesos. That was the most I could get from the ATM, 2,000 pesos. So I did that two times. I got 4,000 pesos. I had no idea how much that was. I figured it was maybe 300 or $400. 4,000 pesos is exactly what I spent in Argentina. That included two taxis, one taxi from the airport to the city, which was about 40 minutes, and another taxi from the city to the airport, which is, again, another 40 minutes. I took care of all of my, all the food that I ate supermarket shopping I did, the restaurants I went to. I ate a nice big sushi lunch on Sunday and I used only the 4,000 pesos that I got from the ATM at the airport. I did not get any more money from the, from the ATM. I still had a, a few hundred pesos left over. I figured, you know, I probably spent about 300 bucks, whatever. Well, I looked, when I got back home, I looked at the exchange rate and I was shocked. 4,000 pesos was only $90. I started laughing, actually. I started laughing out loud. I didn't believe it at first. I thought, there's something wrong with the internet. There's no way that 4,000 pesos is only $90. Any other city, any other European city like that, you can double that for taxis and food and coffees and all this kind of stuff. You could basically double that. I still have some money left over from it. I still have some Argentinian pesos left over. So I found it to be pretty cheap. I found it to be a good value. I enjoyed my time there, and I definitely want to spend more time there in the future. So anybody looking to travel to Buenos Aires, give it a shot. I enjoyed it. Now, regarding the people, regarding the people who said that people were stuck up, they said that Argentinian people, because they're so European, they're stuck up, they think they're better than everybody else. I figured out why I read that on the internet. Travelers lie. Specifically, the kind of people who lie are the backpackers. Who would think that the Argentinian people were stuck up? Backpackers. Dirty hippie backpackers with dirty dreadlocks and uh, dirty clothing, and they stay in hostels, so they look like hobos. Those are the kind of people that said that the Buenos Aires people were stuck up. And I have found that those people always lie in online reviews, specifically in hotel and restaurant reviews. Those people always tell lies. And those people are much like the social justice warriors. They have a very social justice warrior mindset, and the mindset of the backpacker, the traveling hippie backpacker, is the same as the social justice warrior mindset in the sense that they like ugliness and they don't like beauty. So when something is beautiful, 
which Buenos Aires is beautiful. When something is beautiful, they have to say that it's ugly. They have to say that the personality is ugly. I've noticed this in reviews for hotels before. I'll be looking for a hotel. I'll look at the reviews and the reviews will say, oh, this is a great place. And then I'll go there and the place is a dump. It's a dump in the middle of the backpacker ghetto. It's an ugly shithole. But all of the reviews said, what a great place. What a, we love this place. It was perfect for us. And I thought, God damn, why do these people always lie in these reviews? And then it hit me. These backpackers have the mindset of the leftists or the liberals or the social justice warriors, and they enjoy ugliness. So when something is ugly, they say that it's great. And when something is beautiful or great, they say that it's ugly. So I found that to be true about uh, hotel reviews online and food reviews online. And who leaves food reviews? Who leaves hotel reviews? It's mostly the hippie leftist liberal mindset of somebody who loves ugliness and hates beauty. They love weakness and they hate strength. They love the dark and they hate the light. So their reviews are flipped. Their reviews are opposite. So what I've heard about the Argentinian people, that they're stuck up and think they're better than everybody else. No, that was not my experience at all. They just seemed like regular people going out, going about their daily lives. But they had a kind of dignity that I guess the uh, online reviewers don't like. They would prefer that, I think they would prefer that the people grovel at their feet. If the people groveled at their feet, they would say, oh, these people are wonderful. They're some of the best people in the world. But the Argentinians don't grovel at your feet. They have dignity. So therefore, they're stuck up. So there you go. There you are. That's the mindset of the leftist. That's the mindset of the backpacker, the hippie backpacker, the dirty bum backpacker, who loves ugliness, hates beauty. Ooh, what do you say we get started on today's questions? At the end of the last episode, Bill asked, Hi, Victor. Would you be willing to share a bit about the jobs you had before you began your journey as an entrepreneur and perhaps how those jobs led you towards being your own boss? Ooh, great question. And uh, I'm not somebody who comes from a trust fund. I don't come from a rich family. I don't come from a well-off family. I come from a blue-collar family. And in my family, if you wanted money, you had to work for it. I didn't get an allowance. I didn't get... Uh, my point is, if you wanted money in my family, you had to make it on your own. So when I was 15 years old, all my life I've been waiting to get a job so I can make my own money. When I was 15 years old, I got my first job at KFC. Walked in, said, can I have an application, please, for a job? They said, yeah, here you go. When do you want to start? I said, I want to start tomorrow. They said, okay, come in tomorrow. You're hired. All right, I'll do that. So I got my very first job ever, Kentucky Fried Chicken. 15 years old, Started working the cash register at KFC. No, I take that back. Actually, I had a friend who was working there who got me a, who got me the job there. I had a friend who was a cook there. Yeah, he was a cook there. He said, I can get you a job there. So I went in, got it all taken care of, got my job there, 15 years old, KFC. I worked there for a few months, hated it. It was terrible. The manager was a total dick. And I don't usually talk about people like that, but the guy was a total dick. So one day the manager took me aside into the, into the back office and he said, you know, what's wrong? The people that work here say they don't like you. And I said, uh, I don't know why they would say that. I'm just doing what you guys told me to do. Bringing up the orders, taking the money, giving the change. Why would the people working here not like me? Especially when a friend, especially when my friend works here and got me the job. So the, uh, the boss, the KFC boss was a bit of a, a shit stirrer, if you will, trying to play people off of other people. And it was a nightmare working there because of people like that. So I quit that job and I got a job at Pizza Hut. And I had another friend who worked at Pizza Hut. He'd been working at Pizza Hut for a long time. And he said, yeah, come on over here. It's awesome over here. So I went over to Pizza Hut, put in an application. I learned that you have to be 16 years old to start working at Pizza Hut. So I went to my date of birth and I just put the date of birth one year earlier. So it appeared as though I was 16, even though I was 15. So I put in my application, got hired there because I had a friend there who was working there, got me the job there. Pizza Hut, I worked there for a year. I was a cook. I was making pizzas behind the, uh, I was making pizzas for the people. I wasn't a waiter or anything like that. I was making pizzas. And that was one of the funnest jobs of my entire life. Pizza Hut was awesome. I had a bunch of friends working there, got a bunch of my friends hired there. We would just be making pizzas and laughing and having a great time all the time. So working at Pizza Hut for me is totally awesome. I loved it. I was able to save up enough money at Pizza Hut where I could buy new guitars and new amplifiers and all kinds of things like that. So I was making my own money. I was having a great time working with my friends, making pizzas for people. And I tell you what, we never spit in anybody's food. Never did. I know a lot of people are worried about that when you go to fast food. And I can't speak for all fast food places, but I'll tell you where we were. Never spit in anybody's food. 
Doesn't matter how dickish you were with your order. Never spit in anybody's food. Never did anything like that. Though sometimes, sometimes we would put jalapeno juice in the crust of the pizza for people who were not so nice about their orders. And sometimes when some of the female waitresses would leave their Coca-Cola around, we might put some jalapeno juice in it just for some shits and giggles. Just for some laughs. So I worked at Pizza Hut for a year. I loved it. I can't remember why I quit. Yeah, can't remember why I quit. But when I did quit, I went to a call center. A call center, and we had to, uh, good golly, we had to call people and do some kind of survey. The more surveys you could get people to do, the more bonuses you got. I started to work there. I had a bunch of friends that worked there as well, and I started to work there because supposedly you could make a lot of money. And actually, for a high school student, you could make a lot of money at this call center. You would cold call people out of the blue, say, hey, I'm calling about blah, blah, blah. Do you want to do a survey with us? Blah, blah, blah. And it was usually old people, elderly people who would do a survey with you. And everybody you got to do a survey with you, you got a bonus for. And even though I was making some pretty decent money, that job sucked. That job was terrible. It's awful cold calling people. It's one of the worst jobs you can do. And I've done it a bunch of times since then. It's one of the worst jobs you can do. So I worked there for a couple months and I quit. And then... uh that job was, it was pretty fun on the breaks because I had a lot of friends who worked there as well. So we'd have fun on the breaks. We'd have fun after work. But during work, cold calling people, calling people, you know, person after person after person, not a fun way to make money. Not a fun way. So I quit there and then I went to work at a uh, CD store at the shopping mall, a CD store at the shopping mall. And it was at the CD store at the shopping mall that I first learned about gypsies because there were gypsies there who would come in and they would try to steal the CDs, the cassette tapes, and all kind of stuff from you. You have to keep a, an extra special eye on the gypsies. That's what the manager told me. He's like, he said, you got to watch out for the gypsies because they come in here and they steal. They don't buy anything and they steal. I didn't even know what the hell a gypsy was at that time. I grew up basically in a mostly white place, just a very tiny amount of Mexicans, just a small amount of blacks and gypsies. There were no gypsies that went to my high school. So I didn't know shit about shit. I was just a young white kid. Didn't know nothing about nothing. So one day the gypsies came into the store and I learned what they do. I learned how they steal from you. This is what they do. Three or four gypsies will come in. Three of them will disperse around the store and then one will come up to you and engage you in a conversation to distract you while the other ones steal from you. So this one gypsy came up to me and he said, he asked me, your boss doesn't like us. Why doesn't your boss like the gypsies? And I just told him the truth because I didn't know any better. I said, oh, he said you guys steal. He said, well, we don't steal. Blah, blah, blah. We're not stealing. Meanwhile... The three motherfuckers who were in the store were busy loading up their jackets with CDs while this guy was uh, engaging me in conversation and distracting me. So I learned that that's how people steal from you in groups if you work at uh, some kind of retail store. One of them comes up to distract you while the other ones are free to steal. And that's how the gypsies steal. And that's how I learned about the gypsies. That's how I learned that the gypsies are thieves. And that has been my experience throughout a lot of the world. Anytime I see gypsies, I know that they're thieves. I can see that thievery look in their eyes. Anytime I see gypsies anywhere, I keep my hands on my pockets so they can't sneak their little grubby fingers inside my pockets. And basically, everybody knows that about the gypsies in all the world. They just, uh, you can't say it anymore because it's, uh, it's a racist. Well, what it is, it's a, it's a stone cold fact. Gypsies are thieves. That's how they get by. It's their way of life. Everywhere in the world, whether you're in Kansas or Kyrgyzstan, that's what they do. So after the, uh, after the CD store, where did I go? I moved. I graduated high school when I was 17 and I was working at the CD store when I was 17. Graduated high school and I moved to Texas. And in Texas, where the hell did I work in Texas? Once I got my first job in Texas at Blockbuster Video. I was the night manager at Blockbuster Video for a couple of years. And uh, for the younger reader, for the younger listeners of the B&D podcast, Blockbuster Video is where you had to go and rent DVDs if you wanted to watch movies. This was before Netflix and this was before streaming and before YouTube. And people would go to Blockbuster Video. It'd be very super popular. It'd be one of the most popular places on a Friday and a Saturday evening. The place would be just packed with people looking for some DVD to watch for the evening. And... uh I liked that job a lot. I was the assistant manager, the night manager. I would usually work from 5 p.m. to midnight. And on Friday and Saturday, we were open until 1 o'clock in the morning. So I would work from 5 p.m. to 1 o'clock in the morning. And then I'd get home. And at that time, I was making music. That was my big thing at that time. I was a music guy. So I'd make music until 8 o'clock in the morning. And then I'd go to sleep. And then I'd wake up at 4.30 p.m. So I could get to work by 5 p.m. 
and I'd work all night, and I'd go home and I'd make music until the wee hours of the morning, and I did that for years and years and years. I loved it. One of my favorite things that I ever did was making music all night long, sleeping all day. So I enjoyed working a blockbuster video. A lot of girls would come in, flirt with me there. A lot of girls would just end up giving me their phone number. Or they would come in, they would rent a video, they would leave, then they would call me. And they would say, hey, I'm the girl you were flirting with. Don't you want to, you know, go out or something? So there were a lot of pretty girls at that time. A lot more than there are now, that's for dang sure. So this would have been in 2001. Yeah, 2001. I graduated high school in 2000 and uh, started working there in 2001. So that's pretty much where all my good jobs end. Those were the fun jobs I had. Pizza Hut, Blockbuster. Those jobs were a lot of fun. I didn't make any money. You know, five bucks an hour, six bucks an hour. At Blockbuster, when I got promoted to assistant manager, I got a raise to seven fifty an hour. So would never get rich doing that. But I was young and uh, had a good time. Taught me about working. Taught me about what you need to do to make money if you uh, don't have any skills, don't have anything else. And I was going to school at this time as well. I was going to university, which uh, which was a total waste of time. But uh, we'll talk about that in another episode. So I was going to school through all the jobs I had in my late teens, early 20s. I was going to school the whole time. So I left Blockbuster. And then I went through a number of joke jobs, like fake jobs you find on like Craigslist. Got a job at another call center. And I lasted about two hours at this new call center. It was awful. It was terrible. You had to call people. You had to cold call people and try to sell them some kind of yearbook from their college, from their university. So these people would have graduated 20 years ago and you had to try and call them and sell them some kind of yearbook or some kind of whatever the thing was. It was awful. And we were in uh, our training class our first day and the, the guy was telling us what to do, how to do it. And the guy looked right at me and he said, this guy's not coming back. He knew. He looked right at me and he knew. He damn sure knew. I'm never coming back to this. I'm not doing this job because that job was terrible. Call centers are terrible. Anybody listening to this who ever worked in a call center, you know what I'm talking about. Working in a call center where you cold call people, those jobs suck. So quit that. I was there for about two hours. We went on lunch break. I left. Never came back. Where else did I work? I started working in banking. My girlfriend at the time worked at a bank. She was a bank teller. She got me the job. So she worked at one branch. I worked at another branch. And I worked at the bank. I did banking for a couple of years, I guess. Ugh. And this job, because I was going to school at the same time. Now, banks usually want you to work from 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, and some Saturdays. I was going to school in the morning, so I had to modify the banking schedule to allow me to both go to school and to work. So what happened was I had to work six days a week every single day. For a year. So I worked at the bank six days a week. And on certain days, I would go to university. So it, it would be like this. I would have to wake up at 4.30 in the morning on certain days to get to the bank by 5 or 5.30. Because the drive through would open up super early. It would open up at 5.30 or 6 a.m. So every day I'd be awake by 5 a.m. And I wasn't, this wasn't by choice. This wasn't because I wanted to exercise my discipline. I hated it. Hated waking up so early. Every drive, every morning driving to the bank at 5 a.m. I always wanted the same thing. Wanted to go back home and go to sleep. Wanted to go back home and go to sleep. I dreamt about going back home and going to sleep. That's all I wanted to do. Just go back home and go to sleep. I hated making that drive. I hated it so much. So much. But by this time, I was making $9 an hour. Who could ever turn down $9 an hour? I was also going to university, so I needed money to pay for that bullshit. And on so on some of the mornings, I was able to sleep in a little bit later because on those days I had class in the morning. So a few days a week I had class. Every day of the week except for Sunday, I had to work. And it was at this job. I thought, what in the hell am I doing? Why the hell am I doing this? I should be an entrepreneur. And I would see some of these people coming in to the drive through at the bank, just depositing cash or depositing checks. I would think, what do these people do for money? They're not wearing some kind of uniform. What are they doing for money? How do they afford this? Where are they getting this money? So that's kind of where I started wanting to be an entrepreneur. I realized that, hey, driving to work at five o'clock in the morning sucks. What can I do? What can I do? That's where I very first started wanting to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know a damn thing about being an entrepreneur. I didn't know a damn thing about business. I didn't know nothing about nothing. I knew if you want to make money, you got to go work a job. You got to trade your time for a job. Even though I hated it, every morning I hated it. And I would, every damn morning I would think I should just call in sick. I should just pretend to be sick. I just, I'll pretend to be sick so I can go home, go back to sleep. But I went into the goddamn job, did my job, made my money, went home. Of course, you got nothing to show for it. 
You've got nothing to show for it. If you're working some job like that for an hourly wage, you've got nothing to show for it. Now, I had a truck that I had a, a truck payment on. I had an apartment, and that's what I had to show for it. A truck that I owed money on and an apartment that I owed money on. Of what benefit? In hindsight, there's clearly no benefit of going into debt to buy a truck. There's no benefit of uh, renting an apartment if you have to work a job to pay for it. Totally no benefit to it. Now, thankfully, my truck payment was pretty low. My apartment payment was pretty low. I shared my apartment with my girlfriend at the time. I, I want to say our rent was $550 a month. So we just split that two ways. It was not, uh, even though I was making $9 an hour, we were able to afford everything. We could afford our apartment. I could afford my truck payment. We could go out to eat, you know, at least two nights a week. But at the end of the day, obviously I didn't save any money from that. And I was miserable. Hated it. Hated that job with a passion. Hated it. Every morning, I'd wake up and think, fuck, how do I get out of this job today? That would have been the best thing to ever happen to me. If I could just figure out a way to not have to go to work that day. Then I'd feel great. Then I'd feel good. And on the rare times I had a day off, ooh, what a treat that was. What a wonderful treat that was. And I always had Sundays off, but when you work a job, you don't have no relaxation on Sundays because you know what's coming on Monday. You know what Monday means. It means back to the grind. So even though I had Sundays off, forget about your relaxation. Forget about having a nice time. Forget about having a nice day off because Sunday is spent dreading Monday. And that's this is where the seed was planted in my mind because I knew Fuck, I hate Mondays, man. I hate Mondays. I spent all day Sunday dreading Monday. I hate Mondays. And as the readers of the Bold Den Determined blog know, now I love Mondays. Mondays are my favorite day of the week because Mondays are a new beginning. Every Monday is a new chance to make more money and to do something new. So I love Mondays now. But when I worked a job, you better believe I hated Mondays. Hated them. Hated them with a passion. Hated Sundays too because Sunday was spent dreading Monday. Worrying about Monday. Can never relax on a Sunday when you got to go back to the grind on Monday. So I worked in banking for a long time. I moved on from that bank to another bank. And at this other bank, I thought, I'm not making enough money. Here's what I need to do. I need to work a second job. That's what will give me the money I need. Let me go and work a second job. So I worked this bank during the day. I clock out at 5 p.m. At 5.30 p.m., I'd go to a new job, and I had a friend who unloaded boxes from the trucks at a local department store. So he got me a job there unloading boxes in the evening. So all morning, all afternoon, 9 to 5, I'd work at the bank during the day. 5.30 to 9.30 or 10 o'clock, I would go unload boxes at this department store in the evening. So I wasn't making enough money just at the bank. I had the bright idea. Let me go get a second job. That will give me more money. So I went and I got this second job and I worked there for a couple of months. But I quickly realized I don't have any more money than before. Working this second job is literally not giving me any more money. I literally don't have any more money to show for it. And that's when the one of the light bulbs finally clicked. Though it still took me a lot longer to become an entrepreneur. The light bulb clicked for me at that time. You don't make any money when you work a job. You barely just make enough to scrape by. And that's all you make. Even if you work two jobs, you still don't make any money from your jobs. It's a total scam, basically. It's a total lie that to make money, you have to work a job. Because I started working two jobs and I literally had nothing extra to show for it. I literally made no extra money. I was basically working for free. And that's what I realized. Years later, this is what I realized about working jobs. When you work a job, you're basically working for free. Now, especially when you're working a job for $7 an hour, $9 an hour, you're basically working for free. But this is also true if you're making 50 grand a year, 70 grand a year, you're basically working for free because you have nothing extra to show for it. Your job only covers the basic essentials after your rent or your mortgage, your car payment, all your other payments, your insurance payments, you've got nothing extra to show for it. That's always what happened to me. I never had anything extra Never. I never had anything extra from a job to show for it. I never did. Even when I went to two jobs. I worked two jobs five days a week. I never had anything extra to show for it. So in later years, I realized that everybody who works a job is just a slave. You're just a slave if you work a job for an hourly wage. That's what you are, and that's why you don't have anything extra to show for it. Why would you give a slave extra? You give a slave only the bare essentials. That's all you give a slave. Just the bare essentials. Ugh. So, did banking for a number of years while trying to go to 
university and get a university education, which was a total waste of time. And what would happen would be I'd have to work for a while and save up some damn money to pay for my schooling because nobody paid for my school except for me. So I'd have to work. Then I'd have to take six months off of school so I could work and then try to save up money. I could barely save up any damn money. It was hard to sell saving up any money. And basically, I don't know how I did. I don't know how I ever saved it. I don't know how I ever saved a dime and paid for school. So after banking, what did I do after banking? Oh, you know what I forgot to mention? Before I went into banking, I was a night stalker. Now, I don't mean a serial killer. I mean a night stalker at a supermarket. I would stalk the groceries overnight. So I'd go into the uh, supermarket at night, 9 p.m., and I would usually leave about 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. the next morning. So I would spend all of my nights restocking the shelves at the supermarket. We'd pull the pallets out of the back with the boxes of the paper towels and the soap and all kind of stuff like that, the food. Now, my section of the store, I didn't really do the food. I did the like the paper towels and the uh, toilet paper and the soaps and those kind of things. And I had basically the whole section of the store to myself. And I would so basically every night I'd spend alone by myself, stock in the supermarket shelves. And this was during Christmas as well. So every damn night, I swear to God, every night for four months, they played Last Christmas by Wham. And they played it probably 75 times a night. So I've heard Last Christmas by Wham probably 10,000 times. Last Christmas I gave you my heart, but the very next day you gave it away. That song. They played that song over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And I'm sitting there or standing there all night long stocking these goddamn shelves by myself. Because in my section I worked by myself. The other guys worked in a team doing the food because the food was heavier. But the other section, the paper towels and stuff, that was all light and only one man needed to do that. So I did that by myself overnight, three o'clock in the morning. Last Christmas, I gave you my heart every damn night, 75 times a night. So super depressing job. But I made a, I think I was making nine dollars an hour there as well. So every night before going to that job, I'd wake up at about 5 p.m. or 4.30 p.m. every day because obviously I worked all night. I wouldn't be able to sleep at normal schedule. So I'd work all night. I'd wake up at about 4.30 or 5 p.m. I'd drive my car. I'd go pick up my girlfriend. And I'd bring her back to my place. We'd hang out for four hours. I'd drive her back home. I'd drive home. And then I would uh, make the long walk, as it were, to this job. I hated this job as well. Hated it. And I'd play the same damn song in my car every night. This same song by Alice in Chains would make me more depressed about going to my job. So I'd play this song every night. The supermarket was only about two and a half minutes from my place at the time. So I knew exactly the exact moment in the song where I'm going to have to get out of my car and go into work and put in another night of this bullshit. So I listened to the same song to prepare me for what was about to come, which is this nightmare of working all night, stocking shelves alone by myself, listening to Last Christmas by Wham. And I did that job for about nine months. Worked there all night for nine months. And this was before I was in banking. So I worked this job for nine months. Then I got into banking and I went from working all night long and waking up at 5 p.m. to working all morning long, waking up at 5 a.m. Then I got into banking, got into banking for a while, had about four different jobs in four different banks. And then uh, what happened? What was my next job? My next job, I got a job at a liquor store somehow. I took a real step backwards in my career. Let me put it that way. Took a real step backwards. Got a job at the local liquor store because, again, I was still pretending... Here's the thing about university me. I was only pretending to get a university education. I would usually skip school because I was usually so tired from working my damn jobs, I couldn't even wake up. So I'd skip school a lot. I'd drop classes here and there if I didn't like them. I was just really pretending. Like those strippers you hear saying they're stripping just so they can pay their way through medical school and you know they're lying. I was lying as well. Even though I was actually going to university, mentally I was never in university. I was never into it. University for me, I hated it. Hated it. I've always hated school. Hated elementary school. Hated middle school. Hated high school. Hated university. Always hated it. And one of the best things I ever did for myself was to never pay attention in school. Because I never paid attention in school, I never got in, I never got fully indoctrinated as to how to make money. I never got fully indoctrinated that the only way to make money was to get a degree and work some shit job for the rest of your life. Because I'd worked jobs before. I know the reality of jobs. They suck. They're not fun. So I knew that just by working my way through school, I sure as hell didn't want to do this for the rest of my life. I sure as shit did not want to work in an office for eternity. Because every time I would drive to work, whether I was driving to the bank, 
whether I was driving to the supermarket, whether I was driving to the call center, I dreaded going to work. I always dreaded, and that's the word, I dreaded going to work. I hated waking up in the morning knowing I had to go to work. I hated working at night. I hated working in the afternoon. Doesn't matter what time of the day. If I had to go there at 9 p.m. or 9 a.m., I dreaded going there. Hated it. All my jobs, hated them. So this gets me up to about 23 now. 23, left all the banking behind, figured, God, what else? What else? Let me try working at a liquor store. That'll at least be fun. So I took a real step downwards in pay. I think I was making seven fifty an hour at the banks. I think maybe I was making, I was making nine. Yeah, I think I was making nine an hour at the banks. So I took a step backwards. Might have even been making 11 an hour. I don't quite remember. But I took a step backwards and I got a job at the liquor store, the local liquor store. It's called CBS, CBS, the local liquor store. So I would sell liquor to all the uh, all the party people. I'd usually work there. I actually worked there part-time. I couldn't even get full-time hours. Nobody got full-time hours there because the owner is named Duck. He was from Korea. Duck didn't want to give anybody insurance or anything like that. So everybody just got part-time hours. What a nightmare job that was as well. Not only did I have to sell booze to all the people, but I had to mop the floors, clean the bathroom. Sometimes we actually had to go to, he had, he owned two liquor stores, one which was sort of near me and one which was super far away. And he would make you go back and forth between work and both of them. And when I had to go work at the one that was super far away, I spent all my money that I made on gasoline. So again, I was left with basically nothing, I had nothing to show for it. I'd have to go to this shit job and work with this guy at this one, at this liquor store that was super far away from me. I hated going there because I spent all my money on gas. And I always had to work with this guy who was obsessed with the band Guar. He would always talk about Guar. So I'd have to go there, mop the floors, hear this fucking guy talk about Guar all night long. Hated that job. I enjoyed the job a lot more when I could work closer to me because that job was fun. It was in more of a, a suburban area and a lot of girls would come in. A lot of girls would come in by their booze before they go out for the night. And uh, the store was called CBS, CBS Liquor. And they would ask, what does CBS stand for? And we would say, cute boy store. Remember, I'm 23 at this time. I'm a young buck in my prime. So this was before I developed monk mode. So that was fun. We'd flirt with the girls, have a good time. And uh, at that job, that job was pretty fun. I met a lot of friends at that job. I met a lot of friends at that job. And I started going out with them in the evening. They were seasoned drinkers. They were seasoned partiers. They showed me the ropes about the party scene, how to pick up girls in the bars and all that kind of stuff. So I learned directly from them. And that was at about 23. And that's when I started my uh, my crazy party all the time phase. So from about 23 to 26, 27, yeah. You bet your balls. I was out at the bars every Friday and Saturday night trying to pick up new girls all the time. I can thank my job at the liquor store for that. I got fired pretty quickly from the liquor store, though. I can't remember why. Duck fired me because... I can't even remember why. So, liquor store. What the hell did I do after the liquor store? The hell did I do after the liquor store? Oh, after the liquor store. The hell did I do? I got a job at another call center. That's right. I got another job at a call center. This time I was making... Eleven dollars an hour. Ooh wee! This time I had a little bit of, little bit of extra money in my pocket. Got a job at a call center, and this call center was mostly equal opportunity. So there were probably two thousand people that worked at this call center. Seventy-five percent of them were black. They had just very few token white people. I was one of the few token white people who worked at this call center. This one was a little bit better because you never had to cold call people. What would happen would be that people would go into Home Depot and they would get a quote for flooring, for carpet or hardwood floors or something like that. They would have people come out and measure their flooring and then the measurements would come in. We would provide an estimate for them and then I would call them with the estimate and I would sell the estimate to them. So it wasn't so bad. People were expecting this call. It was not a cold call. The job was easy, but again, it was terrible. Calling people on the phone or office all day, it sucks. It's one of the worst things you could ever do. One of the worst things you can do. And you're always expected to be on the phone. Always expected to be dialing, 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 dialing. I'd find reasons to go and pretend to take a shit like six, seven times a day. Just to get away from that goddamn phone. I worked this job for about a year. And it was, was building in my mind. There's something more I can do. There's something more I can do. I never, ever, ever would allow myself to say, I like my job. I would never allow myself to say that because I knew if I said it, it would become true. So I always said, I hate my job. I hate my job. I hate what I'm doing. And whatever you say comes true. I knew that then. I know it now. I would never, ever allow myself to say, I like my job. I would never allow myself to fall into this trap 
of working these kind of jobs for the rest of my life. I would never allow myself that. I always knew I was going to do something more. I just didn't know what. I didn't know when, didn't know how. Didn't know how I was going to do it. But I would never, ever allow myself to say, yeah, I like my job. It's great. Because I never wanted it to become true. But at this job, like I said, it was 75% black. So I learned how, I learned uh, about black people at that time. I learned, I worked with blacks uh, every day for a year. So I get a lot of people on B and D say, Oh, you're racist. You, you don't, you've never even spent time around black people. It's like, no, you're probably the one who's never spent time around black people. I spent a lot of time around black people and black people. I'll tell you what, black people are, uh, black people have always been cool with me and I've been cool with black people. I don't have any problem with black people. That's not the point. The point is when the governments try to forcefully integrate us, obviously it's like mixing oil and water. We don't really mix. We can get along just fine, but when you're forced to integrate with somebody, that's when the problems arise. But I always had, uh, I never had any problems with black people. They would always compliment me on my style as well. It was at that time that I was into style. So I would dress well, wear funky shoes, wear suit coats, suit jackets. So I I would always look nice and look well. And the girls would always try and flirt with me. The guys would always give me compliments. So uh, in that sense, it wasn't a bad job, but I hated it. Had a terrible time there. Totally hated it. Would dread every day going there. I would dread the drive there. Would hate the drive. And of course, of course... I'd be stuck in traffic at 9 o'clock in the morning. I'd be stuck in traffic again at 5 o'clock in the afternoon when I was going home. In bumper-to-bumper traffic. That's the worst thing about having a job, is sitting in that bumper-to-bumper traffic before you get there. It just prolongs the misery. Prolongs the misery. You know you don't want to go where you're going, and you're sitting in bumper-to-bumper traffic. You drive forward two feet, then you stop. You drive forward two feet, then you stop. Drive forward two feet, then you stop. Every goddamn morning for a year. Really gives you time to think. And that's what I did at that job. I spent a lot of time thinking. Still, I didn't know shit about shit. I didn't know shit about being an entrepreneur. I didn't know how to make money by yourself. But I knew, goddamn, man, there's got to be some kind of way I can do it. There's got to be some kind of way I can do it. And during this time, all these jobs I had, the seed had already been planted in my mind. And the seed was starting to grow. Seed was starting to grow. But it's still just a little tiny baby seed. So I left this job. Actually, I got laid off at this job. They laid everybody off. They closed down the center because it wasn't making any money because, hey, say whatever you want about black people, but they're not real go-getters at a call center. They're not super duper excited to go to work every day. And they're not on the ball. I was the, I was the best salesman in the entire building. In the entire building. I sold the most flooring of all people in that building. But I started to realize, hey, I make an hourly wage. I don't make a commission for any of these extra sales that I make. Why am I working so hard for these people? And you know what? I was working so hard. I was doing such a good job. These black motherfuckers said, you should fire him. They said that about me. They said, you should fire him. He works too hard. Makes us look bad. You should fire him. But I I eventually learned. I stopped working hard. Took me a while, but I stopped working hard. And they called us into a, uh, they called us into a meeting one day. All thousands of people who worked there. They called us all into this big auditorium area, called a meeting. And said that they were laying everybody off. They're closing down the center. And everybody's like, oh, God, no. Oh, what are we going to do? Oh, God. Oh. And then they said, we're going to pay you for two months. And I thought, huh? Come again? What? You're going to give us two months extra pay after we leave? Hallelujah. 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 I was so excited when I got laid off from that job because they were going to give me two months of pay. Oh, that might have been the happiest day of my life. And everybody around me was sad and starting to cry and say, well, I've got kids to feed and all this shit. I'm thinking, man, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I'm getting two months of free pay and I don't have to come into work anymore. What an incredible thing this is. Thank God. Thank you, God. So that was the best thing that ever happened to me at that job, getting laid off, getting laid off and getting two months extra pay. So after this job, I went and got some, I went and got another shit job at a call center at some, some credit repair, you know, scam center where, uh, they pretend to repair your credit. It was some kind of scam. This is another call center. Tons of people working there. Some other kind of scam. I didn't make it more than a week or two before I quit. Then I got a job at the, uh, at the local gym, the 24 hour fitness, 24 hour fitness. I started to sell memberships. I was a membership salesman at the 24 hour fitness. And at this job, you made a base salary, which was like $3 an hour or $5 an hour or something like that, something ridiculously low. And then you would make a commission. And the idea being that you would either make your commission payment or you would make your low base salary, which is like 
maybe $500 a month. It was pathetically low. They really scam the people who work at gyms, by the way. The people who sell memberships at gyms, those people make nothing. But at that time, I'd already gotten into working out, loved working out, figured, oh, I'll go work out. I'll go work at a gym. What uh, what else can I do? So went to go work at the gym, went to go work at the gym, sell memberships. I sold a decent amount of memberships. I was able to afford my apartment. At that time, I was living alone. My apartment was $444 a month, and I lived in the Mexican ghetto. But I loved it. It's probably one of my two favorite apartments that I've ever had in my life. Totally cheap. I tell you what, if you want to live somewhere free and happy, live somewhere cheap. Cheap, 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 cheap. So you don't have to worry about making that money to pay your hefty rent or your hefty mortgage. I was paying $444 a month and uh, it was easy to make the payment. I loved it there. And at that time, damn, for whatever reason, at that time in that, of all the places I've lived in, that's the worst place. Physically, if you look at it, that's by far the worst place. It's the cheapest place. It's in the Mexican ghetto. By far the worst. But you know what? You know what's funny? I had the most girls of my entire life living at that shithole ghetto. The most girls. I had a new girl every damn night at my place. And I was still going out at night picking up girls at the bars and all this kind of stuff. So I had a steady stream of beautiful young girls. You know, I'm young at this time as well. Maybe 25, 26, something like that. I just had girls and girls and girls and girls just fucking train loads of girls at this, this shithole apartment in the Mexican ghetto that I lived at for $444 a month. Damn, it was a great time. I have found personally that the cheapest apartments I've lived in have been the best. My two best apartments, by the way, have been at that Mexican ghetto where I paid $444 a month. My other best apartment ever of all time was in Bangkok where I paid $500 a month and I lived there for two years. So little tip for you, if you want to live somewhere happy and feel free, rent somewhere super duper cheap. So then uh, I got tired of working at the at the gym. Of course, yeah, I had no money to show for it. No money to show for it. They give you, it's a scam. They get people to work there, but they scam them. They rob them of their commissions, basically. You make nothing. You make nothing. You got nothing to show for it. So I quit the uh, quit the job at the gym. And this time I thought, ah, I'm going to be smart about it. If I'm going to work on commission, I'm going to make a lot of commission. And I became an insurance salesman. I knew somebody in the insurance business supposedly making a lot of money. Now, in this insurance business, you have to go fucking door to door or you got to call people and you got to sell life insurance and health insurance. And before you can even do this, you got to study and take this test to get licensed by the government. So while I was still working at the gym, I was studying for this uh, this insurance test, this in- insurance exam, went and took the exam, passed it, went back to the company that hired me, and they were real surprised that I passed the exam. I thought, why are you surprised? I'd study for it. I took the exam. I took the test. What else would happen? They said, oh, most people fail this test the first time they take it. I thought, really? Wasn't that difficult? Just read the book and go take the test. That's neither here nor there. So I I quit the gym. I went to work for this insurance company, this life insurance, health insurance company. You got to go make appointments all day. You got to call these people say, hey, are you interested in buying insurance? Usually you would be People who were self-employed or who worked part-time and who did not have insurance through their own job. So I'd have to find these people, call these people, set up appointments. But with every insurance thing you could sell, you could make like 300, 600, 1,000 bucks, something like that. So I thought, all right, yeah, this will teach me how to be an entrepreneur. That's why I did it. I figured it would teach me how to be an entrepreneur. I figured it would teach me how to make money on my own. Because everybody there, they all worked on solely commission. There was no base salary whatsoever. You worked only on commission. Whatever you made is what you made. And what you didn't make, you didn't make. And I worked there for six months. I'm going to say I worked there. I'm going to say that in air quotes. So I worked there for six months. And in six months, guess how much money I made? $600. In six months of working this job, I made $600. But to be fair, I was the worst of the worst. I was the worst one on the bankroll. There, there was no bankroll, but I was the worst one employed by this particular company. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, and I had no real drive to do it. And usually what I would do is I would I would fake sleeping in in the morning because you didn't have to clock in. There was no there were no set hours. There were no specific hours. They didn't say you got to be here nine to five. You didn't have to be anywhere. I could have worked from home or I could have gone to the office. You did not have to clock in. It was entirely up to you. And basically, there was no training system, so I didn't really know what to do. I was not super good at it. You would get leads from somewhere. You would get leads from somewhere. They would give you leads, which are names and phone numbers of people. And you would have to call these people and try to set up an appointment and sell them insurance. And all my time there, I sold exactly one family some insurance. 
and I made 600 bucks. And before I made 600 bucks, I made nothing for five months. I made absolutely nothing. Zero. But I hated this job too. I hated this job so much that in the morning I would pretend to sleep in. I would pretend to sleep in. I would wake up eight o'clock, nine o'clock, and I would go back to sleep, even though I knew that I needed to get up and work this job and make some money. I knew that I needed to do that, but I hated it. and I didn't want to go in. So I'd go back to sleep. Then I'd wake up at two o'clock in the afternoon and I would say, well, it's already too late to work today. Might as well just not work today. I'll go work again tomorrow. I did that every single day, every single day. I would sleep until 2 p.m. And maybe one day a week, I would actually go in and try to make some money. And I'll tell you what, boy, after after five or six months of making zero money, $600 is like $6 million. There's so much you can do with $600 after you've made zero for six months. So making that $600, bucks, ooh, it was incredible at that time. That $600 bucks was life-saving. Ugh. So I quit that job. Then I went into work in the auto insurance industry. The auto insurance industry. Jo- that job I had before was health insurance, life insurance. You had to go door to door basically or cold call people and set up appointments and go sell them insurance. Then I got a job at an auto insurance company who uh, basically I worked at a at an office. God, talking about this now, my job history is ridiculous because at this office, I got a job at this office, this big office with fluorescent lights in this big building downtown. And I was the only one there. I was the only person who worked in this office. And to be an insurance man, an insurance salesman, a car insurance salesman, you've also got to take a test to get your license. So I had to, they hired me without a license and I was making pretty decent money there. I think I was making $13 an hour. At that time, that was pretty good money for me. I was making $13 an hour and I would go in and uh, study for this test and then take the test. And then there was some, there was some reason I had to wait for my license from the state. So there were weeks and weeks and weeks where I had to wait. I swear to God, for a number of months, This company paid me to come in and do nothing but surf the internet. I swear to God, the most money I'd ever made in my life up to that point, this company paid me every day to come in and do nothing but surf the internet. So I spent two months surfing the internet at this job. And it was at this place, at this job, where they paid me just to surf the internet And I was literally the only one there. I was the only person who worked there on this entire floor. Again, I was by myself all day. Eventually, they hired a manager to come in and manage me. The one employee who surfed the internet all day. So after a while, it was me and the manager, who was a pretty cool guy. He was about six feet, seven inches tall. Funny guy, though. Had a good time. But he'd be busy in his office surfing the internet, and I'd be busy in my cubicle surfing the internet. So basically, I was alone. I was the only employee for months. And then eventually, they hired another guy who sat right behind me and surfed the internet all day. It was the most ridiculous job in the world, just sit in this office and surf internet all day long. But it was here that I I found Tynan. And Tynan was the one who gave me... I found a couple people here. I found Tynan. I found Maddox. And I found, I think maybe I found Steve Pavlina at this job. But it was Tynan in particular who opened my eyes, who showed me that you can make money from a blog. I had no idea. Actually, that's not true. It was originally, it was John Chow who opened my eyes that you could make money from a blog. I had an Asian girlfriend at that time who told me about John Chow, this guy making tons of money from a blog. And I thought, what? You can make money from a blog? So I went and tried to read John Chow. His articles were trash and I couldn't read any of them. So I just basically forgot about it. Then I found this guy Tynan, tynan Tynan.com. And he was doing the same thing. He was making money from his blog by selling this book. And he was talking about traveling the world or whatever the hell he was talking about, living in an RV or whatever he was talking about. But I just remember finding him and, and putting two and two together. Oh, you can make money from a blog by selling a book. That's how you make money from a blog. That's one way. So I'd read Tyne in there. I've also found Maddox at that time. Maddox, who runs the blog, the greatest blog in the universe, I think is what it's called. And Maddox was also making money from his blog. I thought, what? What? These people are making money from a blog and they don't have to work a job? That's crazy. That's where the seed was planted in my mind. Because I would surf the internet all day and I would just read blogs all day long. And I'd also be on MySpace talking to girls all day long. So this job, of course, eventually, what do you think happened? They laid everybody off. They can't afford to keep paying people to surf the internet all day and not do any work. 
So they laid me off. I got a severance package. Then I went to work for another insurance agency. And I'll tell you what was bad about this new insurance agency that I work for. They wanted me to actually work. And I didn't want to do that. After being paid to surf the internet all day, I was not prepared to go and do actual work again. But I went and got a new job at State Farm Insurance, and they wanted me to actually go to work. And again, this is the same kind of cold calling bullshit. You got to basically, if you get into auto insurance and you want to sell auto insurance, the first thing you do is you call your friends and family and try to sell them some insurance. So you got to be that annoying hassling guy trying to sell them some insurance. Then after that, you got to find leads. You got to go out and hit the streets, pound the pavement, trying to sell insurance any way you can. And obviously I was terrible at it, but there's a reason why. Everybody is terrible at it. Everybody is terrible at cold calls and cold approaches. It's not an easy way to make money. So of course, obviously, again, not doing well and hating my job yet again. Hated this job so much. Hated, 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 hated. Hated. But I had the bright idea while I was at this job. I thought to myself, I want to buy a house. I had no money in savings. I had nothing to my name. I was living at my girlfriend's apartment for free. I thought, yeah, it's a great time for me to buy a house. I had no professional career. I had no degree. I had no savings. But I wanted to buy a house. Very typically American mindset, I must say. But I wanted to buy a house. So at this job, when I would pretend to be selling insurance, I would actually be online looking at ways that I could buy houses. And it was at this job where the light appeared right before my very eyes. And I learned about ways you can buy houses without any money. And then you can flip those houses and you can make money. And everything in my mind just clicked. I thought, oh, here it is. This is what I've been waiting for all my life. This is it. And I studied this stuff every day, sun up to sun down. I knew, I knew right away. Because in fact, you can be a real estate investor with no money. It's one industry where you need nothing. You can make, you could have nothing today. And in a month from now, you can have $4,000. And, uh, oh, it just clicked with me, just in my brain. It just clicked right away. Just, I knew, I knew this is the way out. This was the way out for me. This is the way I could quit these jobs and I could finally do something for myself for real. Because I had tried all these sales positions where you make commissions and I thought, oh, that will teach me how to be an entrepreneur. But it never did. It just taught me how to be broke. And I was broke. I was broke. I was broke until the time I was 27. But I learned. I spent all day learning, all day learning how to invest in real estate. And again, there are many different ways you can invest in real estate. You can buy a house with money or you can do a sneaky way and buy it a different way. And a lot of people at this time were doing it like that. So there was a lot of activity online showing people how to uh, invest in real estate. And if you've ever been driving around the United States and you see those houses, you see those signs on the side of the street that say, we buy houses. That's what I was looking to do. That's what I was looking into. And eventually I, I would be the guy out Friday night, midnight, putting out those signs on the corners of the street saying, we buy houses with my phone number on it. I'm not going to get into the ways that you can invest in real estate. I'm just going to, I'm just going to say that that's what I did. And I researched it every single day at this job who was paying me an hourly wage, which is a very nice thing to do. I was wasting company time and company money. And I was researching on my own how to invest in real estate and make money in real estate. So I would spend all day long at this job. When the boss is not looking over my shoulder, I would be, I would be reading, 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 educating myself about how to do this real estate thing, about how to do this real estate thing. And I just knew, I just knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is what I was going to do. And I started getting involved with it. I got involved with it. I even started making cold calls. I got my first deal in real estate just by making cold calls. So all that time I spent cold calling working in those, in those call centers, it had taught me how to call people and uh, how to sell. Even though I was never that great at it because I didn't care about the product. I didn't care about any of it. I was just doing it to do it. But it did give me a very valuable tool in that I can call people on the phone or at that time I could, I could call people on the phone and talk to them and try to, uh, try to get a deal done. And that's exactly what happened. I got my first deal done and here's what happened. I was still working this job and I called this, uh, called this guy who wanted to, to get rid of his house and I set up a deal with him. I set up a deal with him. So I had this house under contract. And the way that you make money in the real estate investing world is that you sell the contract. 
So that's the secret. That's the secret key. You don't have to buy the house. All you have to do is sign a contract for the house and then assign the contract to somebody else for money. So basically, I was never in the real estate business. I was in the contract business. I would get a contract for a house. Let's say I got a contract. I'm going to buy this house for $40,000 on this contract. I turn around and I sell this contract to another guy for $50,000. That means I keep $10,000. I give $40,000 to the original guy. I keep ten, dollars and that's how I make my profit. So I had this house under contract and I knew that I can do something with this house. I don't know, I don't know exactly what yet, but I can do something with this contract. So I had this piece of paper, this signed piece of paper in my hand for this house. And I had this job and I had to make a decision right then and there. Got to make a decision because the boss knew, Hey, this guy is a shit employee. He's going to need to step up or step out. So the boss came in to talk to me and he said, what do you want to do? Are you trying to stay here? Do you want to work real hard? I said, you know what, boss man, I got to put in my two weeks. He said, that's fine. You can leave today. And that's what I did. I left right then and there. I had that contract. Now, I was still new. I was still blue. I didn't know the ropes. I didn't know the industry. But I knew that I had the will. And where there is a will, there is a way. I had this piece of paper and I had the will to do it. So I left my job right then and there. I called my girlfriend on the phone. I said, you know what? Just quit my job. We might be poor for a long while, but I'm not going back to my job. It's not going to happen. We're just going to have to tough it out. Maybe I'll make money. Maybe I won't. But I'm going to try this. I'm going to do this real estate thing. She said, all right, I support you. And that was that. 30 days later, I had $4,000 in my pocket. 30 days later from quitting my job, I had $4,000 in my pocket. Guess how much money I made per month selling insurance? About $1,500, $2,000 a month. 30 days after quitting and going into business for myself, I made more money than I had ever seen in my entire life. $4,000 in my pocket. That's $3,000 more in my pocket than I'd ever had in my pocket ever before. Ever. When you get paid your paycheck, you got to pay your rent, you got to pay your truck payment, you got to pay your insurance payment. All kind of stuff comes right off the top. I never had more than $1,000. Never. Never. In 30 days after quitting my job, I had $4,000 burning a hole in my pocket. That's when I knew. I'm on the right track. I'm on the right track. And I did that for a number of years. And now $4,000 in my pocket, it's just a joke. It's just, haha, $4,000 means nothing. Haha, funny, funny joke. But it all started with me making that $4,000. And actually, it all started with just a belief in myself that I could make money on my own without having to be under the umbrella of some company. And then that brings us to where we are today. That was 10 years ago or more. 12 years ago, maybe. That was a long time ago. That's my story. That's how I quit my job and became an entrepreneur. And it was that knowledge of making money on my own that I brought to Bold and Determined. So Bold and Determined was not the first money I made. I was already an entrepreneur in the real estate industry before I switched over to the blogging industry. And I'll tell you why I switched over to the blogging industry is because I didn't want to be stuck in my geographical location anymore. I wanted to be free to travel the world. I didn't want to be in America anymore if we want to get right down to it. I want to get out and travel. I want to get out and see the world. And by that time, I'd read Tim Ferriss' four-hour work week, so I knew it was possible. And that's all you've got to know. You've got to know that it's possible. It is possible to go and travel the world and make money from your computer. You don't have to get into real estate. You don't have to sell insurance. You don't have to get a job at a call center. You don't have to get a job at Blockbuster Video. All you need is an internet connection and a will. Where there is a will, there is a way. You do have to educate yourself. Like I said, I spent every single day of my last job educating myself until the day I quit. And that's what it takes. Education. And I tell you what the best education in the world is. Boldanddetermined.com. That's the best education. And I'll tell you what the best business in the world is. Blogging. There's no overhead. There's no boss. There's nothing but yourself and freedom. And the sky is the limit. So for me, hands down, best business in the world is the blogging business. Beyond a shadow of any doubt. And you know I've worked other jobs. You've just got my job history. You know that I didn't just stumble into making money from a blog. It took me years and years and years. And along the way, I didn't even talk about all the get-rich-quick schemes I tried to do that obviously didn't work out, obviously didn't pan out. All the times I got tricked by multi-level marketing people or get-rich-quick people. It took me years and years and years to stumble upon the knowledge that I give you at boldanddetermined.com. 
It took me years and years and years to stumble upon the knowledge that I give you when you sign up for a blog at badnet.com and you get those four free reports. That's years and years and years of me working jobs and failing at those jobs and trying to learn the true way. Point is, I'm not some overnight success. I'm not some rich guy or rich kid who got everything handed to him. I used to mop floors at the liquor store. I got fired by a Korean guy named Duck. So I've been there. I've done it all. That's my story. Ooh, long story too. Long story. What do you say we try and answer some other questions on today's episode? The Orthovox asks, Victor, what are the defining traits of people who will always remain poor? I'll tell you the number one trait of people who will always remain poor. Fear. Fear is what keeps people poor. Fear of the unknown. Fear of trying. It is people who are afraid who will never try anything new. It is people who are afraid who will never quit their jobs to focus their energy on their own business. It is fear that is the killer of your wealth. Fear. It's not low IQ. It's not lack of opportunity. It's not lack of education. It's fear. If you don't do something for yourself, it is because you are afraid to do it. Because when you go into this world, the world of the entrepreneur, you go into the world of the unknown. When I quit my job, you can bet your balls I was afraid. I was scared. But I did it anyway. I quit my job and I called my girlfriend and I told her, I quit my job. I'm not going back to a job. I will not work a job again. I'm going to do this. We might have to be poor for a long while, but I'm going to do this. She said, okay, I trust you. I believe in you. Guess what? If I let fear get the best of me, I would have never pulled the trigger. I would have never pulled the trigger on anything. I would have never pulled the trigger on real estate if I let the fear get the best of me. I would have never pulled the trigger on BoldAndDetermined.com if I let fear get the best of me. Because when I started BoldAndDetermined.com, I moved to China. I moved to China after never having been anywhere outside of the United States. I moved to China. You don't think that's a scary thing to do? That's a scary thing to do. But I did not let the fear stop me. I let it empower me. So everybody feels fear when doing something new. You can let it stop you or you can let it empower you. And if you let it stop you, you are always going to remain poor. Always. Always. Fortune favors the bold. Don't forget that. You've got to take chances. You've got to not be afraid. And if you are afraid, you've got to let that, you've got to let that fear fuel you and use it in your business. Don't let the fear cripple you. Let it fuel you. Poor people are crippled by fear. Crippled by fear. Karthik asks, what is actually real in society today? This seems like a simple question, but it isn't. When we get to the core of the matter, politics is fake, money is fake, status is fake, and prestige is fake. It seems like professional sports are the one area where merit still actually triumphs. Maybe the reason men love pro sports is because this is the one socially approved outlet where actual competitive spirit can be expressed without being shamed for it. Farming is real, architecture is real, plumbing is real, music is real, but other than this, but other than this, I struggle to find what is truly real. Great question, here's the answer. Everything that you see on the television is not real. Everything you read in the news is not real. You've heard the term fake news, but you haven't internalized it yet. You haven't come to understand that fake news means the news is fake. It's all fake. The television exists to make you believe stuff that is not true. Everything you see on television is fake. It's all a television show. They're not giving you reality. They're giving you a fake narrative that you want to, they want you to believe is real. So what do you see on television? You see the news. You see politics. You see all of this stuff, and then you think because you see it on television, it's real. I'm here to tell you, it's not real. Everything you see on television is fake. It's just a lie. It's a show. It's a drama. The politics you see on television, first of all, people are very obsessed with watching politics and following politics. Is politics so interesting? No, it isn't. You know what's interesting? The drama behind the politics. That's why people follow Donald Trump so much, because of the drama associated with it. And what is drama? Drama is theater. You're watching theater when you watch politics. And when you pay attention to politics, you are watching a play, a joke, a fake. It's not real. 
everything you see on the television is designed to make you excited or sad or scared, afraid. It's something to play on your emotions. That's why politics seems so interesting, because it's fake, it's drama, it's a show. And I have news for you. Everything you see on the television is a show. It's entertainment for you, to keep you preoccupied, to keep you busy, so you don't see what's actually going on in the world. You said professional sports are the one area where men still actually triumph. Well, I have news for you about professional sports. Where do you watch professional sports? Where do you see professional sports? You see them on television. Did you ever notice that the most highly rated games or the most highly watched games are the most entertaining games? How could it be that the most important games are also the most entertaining games? Could it be that they need those that they need these games to be so important so that you watch from the beginning until the end and so that you see all of the advertisements for all of the show from beginning to the end? If the game was not interesting, you would turn off the television. If the game is interesting, you will be glued to the screen. The NFL, National Football League in particular, the National Football League, NFL, football on television, is a trillion-dollar industry. Do you really think that a trillion-dollar industry is left to chance? It's called professional sports. Don't forget the word professional. The NFL, each team on the NFL. Do you remember when the UFC sold for $4 billion and everybody went crazy? Oh my God, $4 billion, so much money. Each team in the NFL makes more than $4 billion every year before the first game is even played. The NFL is the biggest earner on television. It's the most profitable industry on television. Each team makes billions of dollars every year. Do you honestly think this is left to chance? The point that I'm trying to make here is that everything you see on television is not what you think it is. It's not reality. It's an illusion. It's a virtual reality, a fake world. And because it's so exciting and entertaining, we sit glued to the screen and we don't see what's around us. We don't see the real world around us. You asked what is real? Well, turn off the television, put down the smartphone, close the computer, go outside. You'll see people walking around. You'll see families walking around. You'll see children playing. You'll see the birds singing. You'll see the beautiful blue sky, unless you're in America, and then you'll see the chemtrail sky. You'll see all of the real things in the world when you disconnect from the fake virtual reality that we call television or news or media. All media is fake. It's designed to maximize your reaction to it. The news is designed to make you feel fear. That's why you watch the news, because it plays on your emotions. The reason you watch NFL is because it is super exciting, back and forth. You don't know what's going to happen until the very last moment. It's designed that way. All of television is designed to get the maximum from you. All of media is designed to get the maximum from you. When you turn off the television, you go outside, you can hear the birds chirping, the birds singing, the flowers in bloom, the green grass, the blue sky, the white clouds, the young children laughing, smiling, and playing, the family that you forgot you had because you were too busy watching the news or watching football or talking about Donald Trump, the family that everybody forgot they had because they got so involved in the virtual reality. They forgot what is real and what is fake. And to them, the fake world became real and the real world became fake. This happened to all of us. All of us were bamboozled by the media. But we have to understand that it's fake. And fake news is literal. That's really what it is. The stories you hear about, the stories you read about, are things that did not ever happen. They're fake. They are put there for a reason. And that reason is to keep you in a state of fear. And Americans are the most fearful people in the history of the world. People are afraid of other countries in particular. 
afraid of traveling to other countries in particular because they think in other countries they're going to be kidnapped or killed or the government's going to come and chop their head off. So they stay put. And I'll tell you something about America. They don't want you to leave. You know why they don't want you to leave? They want you stuck in that virtual reality, that prison of fear. Because when you leave and you visit another country, you realize how different things are in the real world. You realize that what they said in the news about other countries was a lie. People in other countries are happier and more in harmony. And they spend time with their family and spend time in nature. And they don't live in a state of fear. The American media does not want you to leave. They sell you fear. They want you there so that you keep consuming and buying more stuff. They keep you in a constant state of fear. They do not want you to leave. Why do you think you hear so many bad things about other countries that are not true? Many other countries, I'll tell you what, America is one of the most dangerous countries I've ever traveled to. By far, one of the most dangerous countries I've ever traveled to. Some of these other countries where they say they're going to chop your head off are some of the safest countries that I've ever been to. It needs to be understood that everything you see in the virtual reality, the news, the media, the television, it's fake. It's totally fake. All you have to do is unplug, unplug from the matrix, and go see the real world, and you'll know that what I'm telling you is true. JJ asks, Hey Vic, I've read many books on power tactics such as The 48 Laws of Power, The 33 Strategies of War, The Prince, The Art of War, etc., they all seem to advocate for a veiled Machiavellian approach to winning in life. When I read B&D, I get the sense that you advocate for a more open and aggressive style of gaining power slash winning. When do you believe it is appropriate to use covert slash Machiavellian tactics and when it is appropriate to be outwardly assertive and bold? Also, if I may ask, other than B&D, what do you believe are the top three books every man should read to develop his own ability to gain power? That's a great question, but we need to define power. Power, in this sense is politics. Politics is power. Power is politics. And if you want to succeed in politics, you have to use Machiavellian tactics. You have to use deception. Sun Tzu in The Art of War told us explicitly, deception is the art of war and politics is the enforcement of war. So if you want to get to a position of power, which is synonymous with politics, you must be Machiavellian. So the best books for this kind of person are going to be The Prince by Machiavelli, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And there's one other book that nobody knows about, but it's better than all of the Robert Greene books combined. This book is called The Craft of Power by R.G.H. Siu. And all of the, the 48 Laws of Power, 33 Strategies of War, all of Robert Greene's books are basically this book rewritten. The book again is called The Craft of Power by R.G.H. Siu. Now, when it comes to gaining power in politics, you must be a liar. You must be a deceiver. You cannot tell the truth in politics because you will get nowhere. That being said, I don't recommend that you go into politics because it will steal your soul. Lying will take your soul away from you. If you want to get into politics, you will end up becoming just like all of the people who are in politics. You will become a liar, a professional liar. That's what political power is, the ability to deceive and to cause pain to others. That's what political power is. It's greed in the utmost and deception in the utmost. If you want to gain personal power, if you want to be personally empowered, then you should not be Machiavellian. You should not be a liar. Now, that doesn't mean you have to give everybody any kind of answer that they want. It doesn't mean if somebody asks you for your PIN code, for your ATM card, that you have to give it to them. You don't have to tell people things just because they ask you. You don't have to give away information just because people ask you. The best thing you can do is to keep your mouth shut. If you want to gain power, keep your mouth shut. And only open your mouth strategically. And when you do this, when you don't lie, and only use your words strategically, you have what the politicians don't have, which is character, integrity, the ability to say no or yes, and mean it. The ability to keep your word when you give it. What you have that they don't have is logos, truth, the spirit of God. 
Now tell me, is God a liar? If you believe God is a liar, then you'll be a liar. But if you believe God is honesty, integrity, truth, beauty, then you'll never be a liar. And you will be more powerful than the people who lie to you. Because you'll have something they don't have. Integrity. You cannot break a man who has integrity. You cannot enslave a man who has integrity. J.P. Moustique asks, Vic, why do you think these elite types always get a kick out of revealing who they are to us? Like Alex Jones openly says he's from an intelligence family. Why do they keep rubbing it in our faces who they are? Would they want us to notice or are they mocking us for not being able to see it despite putting it right in front of us? They keep telling us who they are for a couple of reasons. Number one, they feel that people are stupid. They feel that you and I are incredibly stupid. And in this, I have to agree with them. People are incredibly stupid and they do not see what is right in front of their face. They will refuse to see what is right in front of their face. So they keep doing this because people are so stupid that it's like a joke to them showing you who they are because people are just not going to see it. They're not going to notice. People are that stupid that they will not notice what's right in front of their face. So these elite types, they keep showing us and giving us clues because they, they have some kind of need to get our consent. When they show you who they are and you do nothing about it, you give them consent to continue doing what they are doing. They need consent from you. So they must give you these clues so that they can sleep at night and they can say that, well, we gave them all the clues and they just never figured it out, even though it was right in front of their faces. That's how they sleep at night. They give you these clues about who they are. And also they're laughing at you because they think you're stupid and they're right. People are stupid. Do you know how many people have messaged me and saying, I've got to stop talking about the chemtrails in the sky because there's nothing in the sky and that we don't have any proof that they're harmful? Do you know how many people have said that to me? What that means is that they don't have permission to talk about the chemtrails in the sky. They don't have permission from the nightly news. Therefore, they cannot talk about it. People need express permission to see what is right in front of their face. And if they don't have express permission to see what is right in front of their face, they won't see it. So they give us these clues and they give us a ton of clues in every news story, in every television show. We get clues about what's really happening, but people cannot read the clues. They're too stupid. They only see what appears to be right in front of their face. And they don't go even a millimeter deep. They see only the surface. They see no depth. Laszlo asks, if every major religion is a slave religion, what does an aspiring man who seeks the divine or higher truth turn to? How does one find a true, authentic, master, spiritual guide or guru? Where do such wise men reside and how can they be reached? That's a great question, and here's the answer. The answer you will find in your Holy Bible, Luke 17, 21. Neither can you look here or look there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. If you want the answers... You will never get them by turning to an outside source. Salvation lies within. The Spirit of God is within you. The Christ consciousness is in you. And when you turn to other people, guess what? You start to live in their reality. You start to live in their world. And you stop living in your world. You stop living in your reality. So, anybody who pretends to be a master spiritual guide or guru, is actually a con man. 100% of any master spiritual guide or guru is a con man. Do you know why? The kingdom of God lives within you. You must not seek it from an outside source. You must seek it from within. Every guru is a con man. If you want to understand how to get this power from within you, I recommend you go into monk mode. Monk mode teaches you how to connect with the divinity within yourself. There is nobody else on earth that you must rely on. There is no part of monk mode that says you must rely on me as your guide or your guru. Monk mode is about you. And when you go into monk mode and you follow the steps laid out in monk mode, you will see that this is true. It is a real spiritual journey. And it's all developed from within you. When you go to somebody else, what they're going to do is take from you. You will gain nothing from a master teacher, a spiritual guide, a guru. 100% of those people are con men. Salvation lies within. 
Robert V asks, what do you think about men who still live at home with their parents well into their 30s? The automatic reaction in America and other highly individualistic cultures is to ridicule these people. I agree they deserve ridicule if they are sponging off their parents being lazy slobs and not working at anything. But in many developing countries and even in places like Italy, it's pretty normal for a man to stay with his parents until his mid-30s, even if he has enough money to buy or rent his own property. Thinking back to before the explosion of capitalism, it was normal to stay with your family, your tribe, for your whole life. That's a great question, and previously I would have ridiculed any man who lived with his parents past the age of 18, like most Americans do. But I realize today what a foolish thing that is to ridicule people who live at home with their parents. What a foolish thing it is to kick your children out at the age of 18. What a foolish thing it is to leave the house at the age of 18. Do you know why they want you to leave the house at the age of 18? They want you to be atomized. They want you to not be connected with your family. They want you to be alone. Alone, you are easier to steal from. You are easier to control and you are easier to get to become a consumer. They want you to be a buyer a consumer. They don't want you to have strong family ties. So they put out this myth that when you're 18, you need to go and get a job and pay rent at some other place where you live alone or you live with roommates and you no longer have family that you can lean on and turn to so that you no longer have family to support you. Think about it logically. In what world, in what natural world would children leave at 18? What tribe would force their children to leave at 18. Who would want to leave? Who wants to leave their family in the natural world? Who wants to leave their family at 18? Who wants to go from their mom's cooking and taking care of all the bills? Who wants to go from that to working a job so that you can afford your rent? Now you're frazzled all the time. On top of you working all the time, you've got to cook your own food, do your own dishes, clean your own apartment. You've got to do everything for yourself when you leave. How is that better? In any way, how is that better? In fact, the more traditional cultures have it correct. It's much better to stay with your family. It's much better to stay at home. Then you can save money. You don't have to be frazzled and anxious about making your rent money. You don't have to live alone and do all things for yourself. You get the benefit of sticking with your family, which is your support structure, which you should be with. In nature, you would be with. In capitalistic cultures, they want you out so that you buy more stuff. The more disconnected you are from your family, the more stuff you're going to buy because you have no identity anymore and you've got to buy a new identity every single day. They want you disconnected from your people. They want you disconnected from your family. That's why they want you to leave at 18. They want you disconnected. It is much better to be connected. Without a family, you've got nothing in this world. And with nothing leaves a strong desire to buy something new. Without that family support, without that family structure, you become a consumer. Consumer, consumer, consumer. Always consuming. And think about this. Your family home has furniture, electronics, has everything you need. And what happens when you go, when you leave, and you go get your own place? You gotta buy all new furniture. Gotta buy all new plates and dishes. Gotta buy all new everything. You gotta buy, 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 buy. It's great for business to get you to leave the house. It's great for your health, your sanity, and it's great for your wealth if you stay at home. So I highly recommend if you have a good family, you stay with them for as long as you can. Now I realize many people in America don't have good families because the American family has basically been decimated. And I understand that many of, many young men, many young women want to get as far away from their families as they possibly can. I get it. I understand it. The family has been decimated so that they turn us all into consumers. However, if you've got a good family, appreciate what you have. My advice would be to stay with them. Randy asks, I've recently quit all vices. I've increased the intensity of my workouts with Red Beast. I'm on a 90 to 95% carnivore diet, but fuck it, I like ice cream and pizza sometimes. I'm pursuing a new career in real estate. I like to read and enjoy spending quality time with my wife, baby, and dog. Despite this, I get bored or rather I feel unfulfilled living in a clown world because I realize how retarded and unnatural modern life is, especially without vice. How do you deal with the depressing nature of modern civilization? Great question. And when you go into monk mode, when you start eating the carnivore diet, when you get rid of all the vices in your life, you see crystal clear. You see the world crystal clear for the first time. You will never see the world clearly until you get rid of all vices, until you have a clear head. Then you can see why we have so many vices, why we have 
pornography and junk food and trash television. It's to keep you from understanding. It's to keep you from seeing what is right in front of your face. They want you occupied so that you do not question things. And when you go on the carnivore diet, when you start to fast, when you go into monk mode, you see everything clearly. You see it all crystal clear. And they don't want you to see. They want you blinded. Because if you saw crystal clear, you would see very clearly the depressing nature of modern civilization. How soulless it all is. How wasteful it all is. How soul-crushing it all is. They don't want you to notice this. They want you to be busy buying stuff. And of course you feel unfulfilled living in clown world. You left your family behind. Went out on your own. Started your new family with your wife and your dog and your baby. Which is great, and I applaud that. But where would we be in a natural setting? You wouldn't be alone with just your wife and your baby and your dog. Be with her parents or your parents, aunts and uncles, cousins, brothers and sisters. They want to atomize us. They want to make us all alone in this world so that we buy more stuff. That's why it's so depressing living in the, the unnatural modern world. That's the nature of modern civilization. Buy more stuff. Buy more stuff. Buy more stuff. Be alone. Buy more stuff. Be alone. Buy more stuff. Watch this TV show. Don't look outside. Watch Donald Trump. Don't look outside. Watch NFL. Don't look outside. Because if you look outside, you'll see the depressing nature of modern civilization. You'll see the depressed look on everybody's face. Everybody deep down feels exactly the same way. Everybody in modern society is depressed and they bury it with vices. Sometimes it's alcohol, booze, reefer, junk food, TV, reality TV, NFL, whatever the case may be. They bury it with these fake things, these vices. When you take the vices away, you see crystal clear. You see the world crystal clear. They don't want that. They don't want you to see clearly. They want you to continue buying. Heresimo asks, is hormesis worth it? You say white rice and wheat leave you feeling like crap, but you are tempted once in a while to eat them. But is it really worth the impaired body and mind? Okay, number one, I never said I crave white rice and wheat. I said exactly the opposite. I use my words very strategically. So please listen to them. I said I do not crave vegetables. I do not crave fruits. I do not crave grains. I do not crave rice. The only time I ever crave anything, it's sugar. And sugar is a drug. It's the strongest drug in the history of the world. Sugar is stronger than heroin. Sugar is stronger than cocaine. Sugar is the most addictive drug in the world. So what I'm dealing with is a sugar addiction. When I eat the all-meat diet, I do not crave rice. I do not crave grains. I do not crave wheat. I do not crave any of it. I crave only sugar. Now, hormesis. Is hormesis worth it? Hormesis is the, is the thought that you need to eat a little bit of the poison so that you can remain immune to the poison. Because the longer you stay away from these fake foods, these bad foods like the sugars and the, the junk foods, or even the rice and the potatoes and the oatmeal and the vegetables, if you ever go back to them, it's going to cause tremendous trouble for you. However, I'm starting to believe that it's totally not worth it to ever eat these foods because they do nothing but cause problems in the body and in the mind, and sugar in particular. It took me a long time to realize what sugar is doing. When I eat sugar, I get high. I get a feeling of being high in my head. My head seems to have some sort of brain fog, and I feel a little bit high. I finally figured out what that is. Sugar inflames your brain. It makes your brain swell. That's what that feeling you get in your head is when you eat sugar. It's your brain swelling. So, in light of this evidence that sugar makes your brain swell and that's why it makes you feel high, I say that no, it's really not worth it. Hormesis is really not worth it. It's simply not worth it. And this, this became abundantly clear to me when I was in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. I ate their local food and I felt like such trash. And actually, I didn't even bother to tell you this. I forgot. I was awake until 4 o'clock in the morning. When I ate these foods, I could not sleep. My body felt so bad, felt so terrible. I felt awful. I was awake until 4 o'clock in the morning. I usually fall asleep about 10 or 11 o'clock at night. I was awake until 4 o'clock in the morning, feeling sick, feeling terrible, felt awful. And once you get away from these foods and then you eat them again, you see crystal clear what they actually do to you. I said earlier that most people eat these foods every day because they... They get so used to it, they don't know what they're doing to their body. They think feeling bad is normal. It's not normal. It isn't normal. If you want to feel great, I'll give you the recipe for feeling great every day for the rest of your life. Eat nothing but animal products. Don't eat plants. 
Simple as that. Simple as that. Eat food that comes from an animal. Don't eat food that comes from a plant. If you want to feel great, that's the secret. David asks, any tips on how to become emotionless? I cry very easily. Ugh. Yeah, number one, stop being a pussy. But the reality is, if you cry very easily, if you cannot handle your emotions, there's something, there's something causing that. There's something causing that. And usually it's some sort of vice. For example, the marijuana addicts cannot handle their emotions at all. The vegans cannot handle their emotions at all. Alcoholics cannot handle their emotions at all. People who are obsessed with the news cannot handle their emotions at all. If you want to become emotionless, the answer is to go into monk mode. Because in monk mode, you get rid of all vice. You basically become born again. You become born anew. If you want to become emotionless, monk mode will help you do it. Go into monk mode. Follow the plan in monk mode. It will help you. It will reveal to you the world. And it will reveal to you that you don't need to be emotional. That your emotions are being preyed upon and played upon. In monk mode, you will realize that you have full control over your emotions. And your emotions will naturally become centered and become balanced. In monk mode, your entire being will naturally become balanced. It will simply happen naturally if you follow the plan in monk mode. RH asks, why does a man buy a woman gifts or flowers? What are your thoughts on men giving gifts to women and do you think it makes a man look pathetic? Men give gifts and flowers to women because that's what they've been taught to do. Even though they can see with their own eyes in reality that it doesn't work, they can see with their own eyes that women despise men who give them gifts and flowers because everything in our world has been turned upside down. We live in clown world. It's upside down world. Today, women act like men and men act like women. So women don't appreciate anything that makes them feel feminine. They don't appreciate it. They think that you are a fool who is to be taken advantage of when you do something like this. But modern people are too stupid to see what's right in front of their own face. They're too stupid to see that buying flowers for women does not work. So, so many of them continue to do that because they refuse to open their eyes to reality. If you want the woman to love you today, you've got to treat her like trash. That's how you keep a modern woman. Treat her like shit. If you treat her well, she's going to despise you. She's going to hate you. If you treat her like shit, she's going to love you. I'm talking about a modern woman. I'm not talking about a natural woman. I'm talking about a modern woman. Robert asks, why do grown men obsess about watching Marvel and other superhero films? The reason they get obsessed with these films is because they have been treated like children all of their life. And because they have been treated like children all of their life, they start to act like children. They are treated in an infantile manner, so they act in an infantile manner. They have been emasculated all of their lives so that the only semblance of masculinity they can reach out and grasp is in these fake movies, these fake superhero movies. They're so emasculated and infantized, infantilized, that they must pretend to be a real man by watching these Marvel and superhero films. And in America, all men are treated like infants. And if you don't believe me, Go to your local store and try to buy a bottle of beer. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to ask you for your ID. You can look like you're 45 years old. Go try and buy a bottle of beer in the U.S. They'll ask to see your ID. They treat you like an infant who can do nothing for himself. Even if you look like you're 45 years old, they'll ask you for an ID. Are you old enough to buy this beer, young, young boy? Are you old enough to buy this beer? So because they're treated like infants and emasculated, of course they look up to what they think is a real man. Brad asks, who are the Freemasons? Ooh, that's a real strong question. There's actually a lot I've got to say about that. And there's a lot to talk about that's going to tie in with everything we discussed today. What do you say we cover that topic in the next episode of the Bold Dan Determined Podcast? We'll go over who the Freemasons are. And until next time, my friendly friends, have a nice day.